Member, the City Council. Member for uh, great... Petrie needs to resume his seat. We've hit, we've hit two o'clock. In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice, I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he's dumped his latest signature energy policy today because he's lost control of the parliament? Can he also confirm that he fronts a minority government because the Minister for Home Affairs deposed Malcolm Turnbull? And why is Malcolm Turnbull no longer the Prime Minister of Australia? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What the uh, Leader of the Opposition just put to me at the outset of his question is complete rubbish. And that has surprised me because the Leader of the Opposition is always talking rubbish, Mr Speaker. He talks rubbish all the time. He talks rubbish in here. He talks rubbish outside of here. We all remember at the last election he went around talking rubbish, saying that we were ever going to sell Medicare, for goodness sake, Mr Speaker. Well, I can tell him that bulk billing in Medicare is at record highs under our government, Mr Speaker. I can tell him that hospital funding is at record highs and will be in the future under our government. And the same goes for schools funding, the same goes for infrastructure funding, and the budget is coming back into balance and we will be announcing that on the 2nd of April of this year, Mr Speaker. So what we will be doing as part of our broader economic plan is to ensure that we're not only meeting our environmental commitments, but we're doing the right thing to get reliable energy into the electricity market. And we'll be doing that with the big stick and we'll be doing that with every tool at our disposal. On my left. All I know is that the Leader of the Labor Party is not prepared to take on the big energy companies, just like he's not prepared to take on the big banks, Mr Speaker, because he's going to sell out the mortgage-broking industry and hand the power back to the big banks. The Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the, Op of the Labor Party, Mr Speaker, is very big on talking rubbish, and he started off on that vein today. The member for Forest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government is working to close the gap for Indigenous Australians? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank the member for her question and her keen interest in this topic and the interest of all members in this chamber on this very important issue of closing the gap for Indigenous Australians. And I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his remarks today on this matter as well. As I said today, there are three important things uh, in that speech today on closing the gap. The first one is, is that while we recognise the closing the gap process was set up with all the best of motives, it's time to refresh that process by having genuine partnership with Indigenous Australians about what these goals are, what the targets are and, most importantly, the actions that need to be taken to achieve these outcomes, and that that must also be done in partnership with states and territories. The suggestion that any member of this chamber, whether they be the Prime Minister or anyone else, can come in here on an annual basis and pretend to think that they and they alone or one level of government or one agency can go about closing the gap in this country is to misunderstand the fundamental challenges we face in this most important of issues for our first Australians. So that refresher process is underway. It is working closely with state and territory governments and, most importantly, it is working closely with the peak Indigenous organisations who will be working with those other agencies of governments to ensure we get the refresh process right and we set targets. The second point I made, Mr Speaker, is yes, we must close the gap, but we also must stay positive and keep the hope alive about where we're heading. And we need to ensure that every time a child, an Indigenous child, gets into school and stays into school, we recognise that as a major change for that young person's life and that will change communities. And the same is true whether it comes to housing, of getting young and other Indigenous Australians into work, whichever program is used that, uh, to achieve that outcome, and we remain committed to all of those programs which are getting young and other Indigenous Australians into work. But, Mr Speaker, as we move forward with the closing the gap process, we need to have focus, and as the Prime Minister and for our government, we are going to have that focus. 
and we are going to focus on what the special envoy has recommended, and that is to get Indigenous kids in school and to ensure they stay in school for longer. And that's why today we have announced our teacher boost for Remote Australia, removing all or part of the help debt for 3,100 students to encourage more teachers to work and stay working in very remote areas where the greatest disadvantage exists for Indigenous Australians for education. A youth education package of some $200 million for extra support to give more Indigenous students the support and mentoring they need through their secondary studies. And getting kids to school by working community by community and school by school to invest $5 million in remote and very remote areas for projects that support and promote local school attendance. This is our plan. This is our commitment. The member for Port Adelaide. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that today the government dumped its 11th signature energy policy since the last election? Can he also confirm that the government is now crab-walking away from its plan to fund new coal-fired power stations and indemnify their operators at a cost to taxpayers of $17 billion per station? When does the government plan to announce its 12th energy policy? Prime Minister has the call. Well, now we've got another member of the Labor Party just coming up here and speaking rubbish, Mr Speaker. I mean, you just, it doesn't make it true that you just come up here and assert these things. It doesn't make it true. Mr Speaker, we remain committed to our policies, our policies that are designed to ensure there is reliable energy in the grid to ensure the power prices can come down and that Australians can, be, uh, can have the reliability that their lights stay on, Mr Speaker, something the member from South Australia I know would find hard to deal with, given the Labor government in the South Australian Parliament at the time ensured the lights went off because they were not focused on delivering reliable energy into the system. Mr. Speaker. So our policies are designed to do that. We have now, working through the states, ensured that we have contracted reliable energy going into the eastern states electricity market as a result of the reliability guarantee that our government championed and we have put in place. So, Mr Speaker, we stand by our policies, whether it's taking on those big energy companies to ensure that they're doing the right thing by Australians. The Labor Party is happy to roll over to them, Mr Speaker. They roll over on lots of things in the Labor Party. They roll over on the energy companies. They roll over when it comes to banks, when they blow out of the water, mortgage brokers, Mr Speaker. And we know they roll over when it comes to keeping Australians safe and secure, by rolling over when it comes to protecting our borders and rolling over to the Greens and the left wing of the Labor Party and others that would seek to undermine our borders. Mr Speaker, the Labor Party roll over any time anyone comes near them. That's why they can't be trusted. They cannot be trusted by the Australian people to make Australia stronger because they are weak and their weakness will infect this nation. The member for Canning, I think, was... Just, just Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> My question is to the Prime Minister: Will the Prime Minister explain to the House what is required for strong borders and for keeping Australians safe and secure? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Canning for his question, and I thank him for his service, as I do all service men and women in this place and outside of this place, and veterans. We thank them for their service. They understand as. I would hope all people in this chamber would understand, and I certainly know that the government members understand, that to have a national security policy to keep Australians safe and secure, you need to understand and appreciate the threats that the nation faces. You need to ensure that you have a plan to address those threats, and I outline that plan that has been working for Australia under our government on Monday of this week to the National Press Club that addresses those threats. You have to be prepared to resource that plan by ensuring you have economic policies that provide for a stronger economy and that you have the budget management skills to bring the budget back into balance so you can support those important investments to keep Australians safe and secure. These are all incredibly important elements of having success successful national security policy in this country. But you know, there's one thing more important than all of that. More important than all of those things, you've got to have the conviction to take the action and follow through, Mr yeah. Speaker. That's what you've got to have. You've got to have the medal, you've got to have the ticker, you've got to have the resolve 
to actually see things through right. and implement these decisions and not roll over to whatever wind might blow your way uh, to make you compromise Australia's national security and trade it away. That will never happen under a Liberal Nationals coalition yeah. government, Mr Speaker, but it did happen in this place this week by the leader of the Labor Party when he rolled over, Mr Speaker, and compromises and traded away Australia's border protection. Now, I wondered why he would do that, Mr Speaker, but I think it's pretty simple to understand. You don't value what you never built. You, don't, you trade away what you don't value. And the Labor Party does not value stronger borders because this week they traded them away, Mr Speaker. They just threw them away carelessly to try and solve some internal political problem for the leader of the Labor Party who couldn't stand up to the voices in his own party, let alone those without his party, to stand up for stronger borders. And if you haven't built it, you don't understand, you're happy to let it just fall into disrepair. And that is what would happen under this leader of the Labor Party. He is a weak individual, Mr Speaker, when it comes to national security, always going for the lowest common denominator. Every time we have brought legislation into this place on national security legislation, yeah. he has always sought to drag it down to the lowest common denominator and then claim some form of bipartisanship. There is not a cigarette papers difference between us. There is a phone book when it comes to national security. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. As the Prime Minister believes his so-called big stick legislation is so important, why has it been removed from the daily program and when will, it, when will he put it to a vote in the parliament? The Leader of the House has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker the the program is settled by the Leader of the House, uh, in consultation of course, with ministers and uh, with the parliamentary liaison office. Mm. The legislation to which the uh, Deputy Leader refers, the divestment bill, is part of that program, and I can confirm that it has not been removed from the notice paper. Next question. The, it's the independence question. The member, member for Mayo has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services. Recently, I hosted an NGIS forum where participants shared their frustration at not being allowed to see their draft plan prior to it being submitted by the NDIA. Plans with the wrong birth date and name, leading to weeks of delay and exclusion of services. Worse still, some plans don't reflect what was requested or needed. 27-year-old Mitchell has spastic quadriplegia and needs assistive technology to open his front door. Instead, he was given a gym membership. Not being allowed to view the draft plan leaves many feeling disempowered and disrespected. Minister, why won't you let participants view a copy of their draft NDIS plan before it being submitted for approval? The Minister for Families and Community Services. Well, I do thank the member for Mayo for her question. She's shown a strong interest in the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity to work with her on a number of cases. And I would certainly say, in relation to the specific instances that she's mentioned, I'll be very happy to speak to her about the specifics of those. But what I would say is, uh, the member is absolutely right to emphasise the importance of the plan. It is very important that a plan is developed uh, which meets the needs of the participant in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We now have some 250,000 Australians supported by the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and the process of having their plan developed and finalised is absolutely critical. That's why uh, the National Disability Insurance Agency, under our Liberal National Government, has been working to improve the arrangements in relation to plans. For example, uh, from October of last year, a new general participant pathway was rolled out so that uh, NDIS participants can be assured of having a face-to-face -face meeting as part of the process of developing their plan. And of course, as the plan is developed, there's an iterative engagement process with their local area coordinator. Uh, that fits with a range of other changes and reforms that we've introduced, including, for example, uh, the enhanced 
uh, My Place Portal, the Enhanced Provider Finder, specialist pathways for participants with particular needs. So in October, we announced a new tailored psychosocial the will disability his stream. Seat for a second. The member for Mayo on a point of order. Thank you. On a, on a question of relevance, Mr. Speaker, my question is very specific. Why can't participants view a copy of the their plan before it goes to the for NDIA? Mayo will resume her seat. As I've pointed out on numerous occasions, in a 45-second question, there was more than just one question. And even if the member for Mayo, member for Mayo, I'm, I'm trying to address your point of order. I don't really want to have a nodding contest with you, if that's OK. So I'll take a little bit of time now to do that. In a 45-second question, the member for Mayo might believe there is just one question, but all of the other material that's a non-question, strictly speaking, shouldn't be there. I allow it, just really for the smooth functioning of the House, to be honest. But you can't insist that the, member, uh, the minister not refer to it. You simply can't. If you want to ask a single question, just ask it. The minister has the call. Uh, well, um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in relation to plans, uh, the point I'd make to the member is there clearly has to be a point in the process at which the plan is finalised, provided to the participant. What's very important to be clear on is that if the participant has concerns about the plan, and of course there will be instances where the plan is not perfect, of course that's the case, then what the participant has the opportunity to do is first of all ask for an internal review of the plan, and that happens regularly and routinely, and changes are regularly made if it turns out that the review recommends that changes should be made. And of course then there's also the opportunity to go to the AAT to uh, appeal to the AAT in terms of the contents of the plan, and of course that also regularly and routinely happens. So I do thank the member for her strong interest in the NDIS, now serving some 250,000 Australians. Of course, uh, there are always improvements we can make, and we are working hard to make continuing improvements, uh, improving the participant pathway, new specialised participant pathways where appropriate, uh, and continuing to deliver a fundamental reform now supporting some 250,000 Australians transforming and improving lives. The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for, for Home Affairs. Will the minister update the House on the importance of maintaining Australia's strong and consistent border protection policies? Is the minister aware of any threats to the integrity of Australia's borders? The Minister for Home Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Bonner for his question. And everybody on this side of the House understands that you need to get border protection right. We need to make sure that we don't see kids drown at sea or go into detention. And Mr Speaker, this government has worked day and night to stop people arriving illegally by boat, and we've got the kids out of detention. We have closed 19 detention centres. And Mr Speaker, we don't want to see a return to the desperate days that we saw when Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard were in control of the Labor Party, but I fear we are watching a rerun of that train wreck under this Leader of the Opposition. As people now understand the bill that was rushed through by the Leader of the Opposition and the Greens in this chamber and the Senate this week, Mr Speaker, as people start to look at the implications of that bill, people realise how dangerous that piece of legislation was. Now, Mr Speaker, at the moment, the government has the ability, under the Migration Act, to stop somebody accused of sexual assault, for example, right. hopping onto a plane, say, in Dubai or Wellington, Washington, wherever it might be, to stop that person boarding the plane to come to our country. That is a reasonable prospect in any circumstance, and I believe in any reasonable person's mind, a power that should be vested in the government of the day, Mr Speaker. There's no doubt about that. Nobody could argue against it. But it derives, Mr Speaker, from section 501 of the Migration Act, and there are 12 parts to that Act. The difficulty is that with Labor's approach, they have abandoned 11 of the 12 sections. So it means, Mr Speaker, somebody coming from Manus or Nauru, under the Leader of the Opposition's now law, that person could come to our country. Now, I don't believe, Mr Speaker, that the Australian public support that. I don't believe that the Australian public want to see kids back on boats or drowning at sea. But I can say to you, Mr Speaker, what has happened this week 
is the Labor Party has completely undermined their own credibility. They went to the last election promising the Australian public that their policy would be no different to that of the coalition. The reality, Mr Speaker, is that they have abandoned temporary protection visas. That is a central pillar of our success of Operation Sovereign Borders. They have walked away from it. There are only two remaining pillars. One is in relation to offshore processing. This week they completely abandoned it. It leaves one pillar, Mr Speaker, that is turning back votes where it's safe to do so. Does anybody believe in this chamber around the country that this Leader of the Opposition would be able to turn back boats where it's safe to do so? Of course not, Mr Speaker. The people smugglers understand that Labor is weak on border protection, and the Australian public this the week Minister has seen Stein it on full display. Concluded. <laughs> Members on my right, the member for Blair has the call. Member for Blair has the call. Members on my right. That's right. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members my on question... my right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. The financial review reports the government has a $423 million contract with the secretive Paladin Group, a group registered to a beach shack run by a director charged with fraud and money laundering, and which is charging taxpayers $20 million a month for services worth just $3 million. Can the minister guarantee this almost half a billion dollar contract meets the probity required for the spending of taxpayers' money. The Minister for Home Affairs has the call. So, Mr Speaker, I, I'm actually quite touched, I've got to say. I mean, he doesn't get much of a chance to ask a question. He doesn't ask questions very regularly in this place. And, Mr Speaker, you can see why. So let me come to it, Mr Speaker. The department under the the department, I'll scream and yell all you like, it won't make any difference. You're hopeless on border protection as well. So, Mr Speaker, the reality is that the federal government contracts to companies. There are federal procurement rules in relation to contracts. The department, not the ministers, deal with procurement. And if there are issues, the department, the secretary of my department, uh, will deal with those issues, Mr Speaker. But I can tell you, I can tell you what this contract is about. It's about delivering security services why would you need why would you need services of this nature why would you need services of this nature say on Manus Island or Nauru for example you'd need it because the labor party bought 50,000 people on 800 boats now tragically 1200 didn't make it mr speaker as we know they drowned at sea but many people made it and when mr rudd set up the arrangement with the png government to open manus and to put women and kids and people onto Manus Island, it meant that the government, in very quick fashion, had to put up tents, had to have people living in dreadful conditions, had to contract very quickly. A horrible situation, but we're seeing it potentially unfold again if this leader of the opposition wins the election in May, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality. Labor has been a disaster on border protection. They spent $16 billion money that could have been spent on hospitals here, could have been spent on roads here, could have been spent on all sorts of government expenditure such as listing medicines on the PBS. Don't forget that Labor ran out of money and they couldn't list drugs anymore, Mr Speaker, when they were last in government. So imagine asking a question about why we're spending money on the detention network. We're still cleaning up your mess. That's the problem, Mr Speaker. We don't clean up Labor's messes overnight. This has taken years, and we've got to a position where we have closed 19 detention centres. We've got to a position where we've got the 8,000 kids that Labor put into detention out of detention. And yet we're facing the prospect this week in Parliament, Mr Speaker, where Labor wants to undo all of that, to bring people of questionable character to our country, to bring people to our country which will send a message to people smugglers that they are back in business. Why would the Labor Party do that, Mr Speaker? Why would they risk billions of dollars and lives again? Why would the Labor Party do that, Mr Speaker? Because this Leader of the Opposition is weaker than Rudd and Gillard combined. Yes. The Attorney-General will cease interjecting just before I call the member for line. 
I'd like to inform the House we have joining us uh, on the floor this afternoon His Excellency Mr Pedro Rodriguez de Silva, the Ambassador of Portugal to Australia. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you and I call a member for line. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on the cost to regional Australia of failed border protection measures? And what is at risk from different approaches to managing our borders? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for line for his question. Mr Speaker, the answer to his question is all about opportunity cost, Mr Speaker. Opportunity cost, what we've lost in infrastructure when Labor was in government because of the lost opportunities that could have happened had we not been spending, had they not been spending, had the Commonwealth not been spending money on 19 detention centres, on money cleaning up the mess that they left in immigration, on their weak border measures. Mr Speaker, I'm asked about uh, infrastructure. Mr Speaker, when I was uh, in my early ministry, I visited uh, uh, Amberley Raff Base. Amberley Raff Base in the uh, member for Blair's electorate. And I'm glad that the member for Blair has been taken out of witness protection in question time today, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the group captain there, group captain there, said to me, uh, "If ever you get the opportunity, if you're the uh, minister for roads, I'd like you to do something about the Amberley interchange, the Cunningham Highway." Well, you know what? Uh, not because it was politically expedient to do so, but because it was the right thing to do, we funded in last year's budget $170 million for the Cunningham Highway. Had I ever received, or had previous uh, transport and infrastructure ministers ever received correspondence from the member for Blair? Probably not. I certainly didn't. But you know what? We funded it because it was the right thing to do, because the group captain said to me, you know what, if that road isn't funded, one day there's going to be a dreadful accident there. And we funded it. It wasn't even on the Queensland Labor priority list. Yes, he nods. Yes, he nods. But you never, the member for Blair never raised it. But you know what? Well, we did because it was the right thing to do. And Senator Stoker was there when we visited that site. The, the member for Maranoa was there. He joins uh, Blair at Kingaroy, and he knew that it was the right thing to do. Did the member for Blair ever once? Did he ever once, when he served in the Rudd-Gillard years, when $16 billion was being wasted, $16 billion was being blown away on immigration, did he ever put up his hand and say, you know what, I'd like money for the Amberley Interchange. I'd like money for the Cunningham Highway between Yamanto and Creek, uh, Ebenezer Creek. Did he ever once say that? I doubt it. I, ever doubt, I doubt that he ever went into caucus and fought hard for it. And often we hear from the member for McEwen, the good old member for McEwen is talking about uh, phones. Uh, mobile coverage. Not once, not one phone tower did your side of government, when you're in government, ever fund. But you know what? 687 mobile phone towers that we have that we have funded, and 671 of them we have installed. That's because we get on the job with the job of making sure that we spend the right amount of money on infrastructure. And you know what we do? You know why we do it? Because we've got tight borders. Because of the. Uh, Prime Minister, when he was the Immigration Minister, and the Home Affairs Minister now, because they have been tough on borders. They have made sure, made sure that we have tightened up our borders. That is what we do. We do not waste $16 billion on weak the borders The Deputy like Prime Union. Minister's time has concluded. The member for Hunter. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer him to request for an emergency meeting of the National Party. Uh, to discuss his decision to dump his latest signature energy policy. Why didn't the Prime Minister tell his deputy he was dumping his so-called big stick legislation before the Treasurer briefed it out? And given this government is so chaotic that one half doesn't know what the other half is doing, is this what the Prime Minister meant when he described the his own Member government will pause. as the Muppet? The Deputy Prime Minister no, the Member Hunter will just resume his seat for a second. The Deputy Prime Minister will cease yelling. The member for Hunter will begin his question again. And I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer him to request for an emergency meeting of the National Party to discuss the decision of the government to dump its latest signature energy policy. Why didn't the Prime Minister tell his deputy he was dumping his so-called big stick legislation before the Treasurer briefed it out? And given this government is so chaotic that one half doesn't know what the other half is doing. Is this what the Prime Minister meant when he described his own government as the Muppet Show? 
Just before I call the Prime Minister, um, I don't want to think that I'm uh, being soft on the Deputy Prime Minister, but having had the opportunity to hear it again without interjection, I can very clearly say the first part of that question was absolutely out of order. And, uh, the Prime Minister can address himself to uh, the final part of the question. If well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, another Labor member just coming up here talking absolute rubbish. It's just complete rubbish. That's the answer to the question. You're talking rubbish, absolute rubbish. But I'll pick you up on one point. You talked about chaotic. I remember when I was the Shadow Minister for Immigration, I remember the chaos that engulfed the former Labor government because of their failure on borders. Because of their absolute manifest failure, that government fell apart. It fell apart not because, I mean, yes, they had internal division, that was true. Yes, they had the Leader of the Opposition now, back then, undermining leader after leader. That's all true. But the reason their government fell apart was because of their manifest failure on a key issue of policy, which was to protect Australia's borders. And as a result, the costs kept mounting up. Up to $16 billion was ripped out of the budget, all predominantly as a result of the incompetence and failure to act from the now shadow treasurer and then the worst immigration minister Australia has ever seen, who now wants to be the treasurer of the country. That chaos, $16 billion, Mr Speaker. And now, and now this leader of the Labor Party has said for the last five and a half years, oh, there's no difference between Labor and Liberal and National when it comes to border protection. That is untrue. It's never been true. It is a falsehood he's tried to put on the Australian people for so long. As the Minister for Home Affairs has, has said, a, they are going to abolish temporary protection visas, the very thing Kevin Rudd did back in August of 2008, which set the boats running in the first place. What that means is Labor will provide permanent residence to people who illegally enter Australia. That's what they are going to do if they're elected. Second point, they have abolished offshore processing as we know it. They have abolished it. It will not be the tool that we have put in the kit that we have built that has been an effective part of our border protection framework. And thirdly, the third plan, turning back boats where it's safe to do so. The only thing that the Labor Party will turn back is they will turn back the successful border protection policies that this government has put in place, Mr Speaker. And the reason they will do all of those things is when it comes to border protection, they don't believe it. There is no steel in this Leader of the Opposition when it comes to border protection and national security. And that's why, under this Leader of the Labor Party, what we will see is the weakness that is inside him work its way out into the national security policies of this country. And that is why he is unfit to hold the office of Prime Minister. Yeah. The member for Forrest. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Will the Attorney General inform the House on how weakened border protections will affect our justice system? The Attorney General has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. And Mr. Speaker, what has become very clear is that Labor members themselves either don't understand what their own Medivac laws do, or they can't now bring themselves to publicly acknowledge how their own laws work. And we've had several days of the member for Grainler come out with the nothing to see here response, where he said it essentially codifies what the government has been doing. No particular changes, nothing to worry about, steady as she goes. Well, that is nonsense. There are several very key differences. And let me just raise one of those differences here. Previously, the minister retained and exercised a general discretion to not transfer someone where on character grounds they would expose the community to serious risk of criminal conduct. Things that he took into account in making that decision? Were there reasonable grounds to believe the person had engaged in serious criminality previously? Had the person been charged with a serious criminal offence? Was the person on trial for a serious criminal offence? Had the person been convicted and were they awaiting sentence for a serious criminal offence? That discretion is now gone. A very serious and significant change. We had the member for Scullin asked a very simple question today. The question was, under Labor's laws, would the minister still have a discretion to prevent the medical transfer of someone where there was a strong case against that person and they were charged with murder? 
And here was the answer from the member for Scullins. Well, that could well be the case. These are all going to depend on the circumstances of the cases. This is actually the sort of discussion we should be having played out in Parliament, isn't it? I might address that answer in two parts, Mr Speaker. The first point is that you are simply plain wrong, and this is not hypothetical. We have been racing against time to try and assess the people that will be subject to these transfers. I mentioned one case yesterday. We also now know there is an individually, individual currently in regional processing who has been charged with assaulting a medical official who has a history of violence and who has allegedly been charged in mur with murder in another country. The minister's discretion to refuse that transfer is gone, absolutely gone. And if I might address, I might address the second part of the member for Scullin's answer, the previous head of the Socialist left, the second part of the answer was this. This is actually the sort of discussion we should be playing out in the parliament, isn't it? Well, we might say that is a hard discussion to have in parliament when you gag the debate on the bill. A very difficult discussion to have in parliament when you gag the debate on the bill. But don't worry, Huckleberry, because we will talk about this every single day between now and the election, every single question time. You gag the debate on bills that fundamentally change the border protection settings of this nation and have made our border protection weaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. In May 2017, Labor called for a Royal Commission into the violence, abuse and neglect of Australians with a disability. For the last two years, and again a few hours ago in the Senate, the government has said no to this Royal Commission. Given ongoing and recent shocking reports about the mistreatment of Australians with a disability, will the Prime Minister finally join with Labor to support a Royal Commission which Australians with a disability and their loved ones have been calling for for the last two years? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My government takes abuse and neglect of people with disability very seriously and we are engaging in substantial reform to improve the treatment of people with disability, many of whom will be eligible for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. As he would know, there have been multiple inquiries looking into issues of abuse and neglect of people with disability at both the federal and state levels. Now, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which I am very pleased to acknowledge, which was initiated by the former Prime Minister Julia Gillard, Julia Gillard and supported by the members of this side of the House and has been supported by us as we've been in government, as we've fully funded this initiative and we've been taking it through the implementation phase. This is the most significant social reform since Medicare and it will provide real choice and control for people with disability in the services they receive. Now, as responsibility for special disability services shifts from the states and territories to a national system through the NDIS, the government has established new significant and comprehensive safeguards to prevent abuse and neglect of people with disability under the NDIS. The government has committed $209 million to establish the NDIS Commission, which commenced operation on 1 July 2018 and continues to provide the National Disability Abuse and Neglect Hotline. These resources deliver the protection of people with disabilities that they deserve. Now, the Royal Commission to investigate the quality of care and safety provided in residential and home-based aged care services includes how best to deliver aged care services to people with disabilities residing in aged care facilities, including younger people, and will complement the action the government is already taking to improve the treatment of people with disability, and particularly for young people um, living with a disability. Um, the, the Leader of the Opposition may be aware of the initiatives we're putting in place to support investment in the development of accommodation for young people with disability, of the sort that, as the member for Brisbane will know, is championed by organisations like Young Care. And we're backing that in. The truth is, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is in its early phases of implementation as these responsibilities are transferred. These need to be um, practised and put into place, and we will always remain open to what more can be done to identify any egregious issues or any, any um, lack of care or, or support provided to people with disabilities in this country. Right now, our focus is on implementing the National Disability Insurance Scheme, getting it right. It's a difficult job, and it has not been a perfect implementation or it was never a perfect inauguration when it first came into being. But one thing is true. I believe it has always enjoyed 
the bipartisan support in this chamber and beyond the major parties to the other parties and independents in this chamber. And I would like for us to continue to operate in that vein. The member for Bowman. Yeah, thanks, Speaker. A question to the Treasurer. Uh, will the Treasurer outline to the House what the costs are of weakening Australia's border protection measures? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Bowman for his question. And I can inform the House that the cost of weakening our borders is high, Mr Speaker. It is very high because the cost to the budget of reopening Christmas Island, of transferring the detainees from Nauru and Manus to the mainland, and the administrative costs of implementing these changes is $1.4 billion dollars mr speaker and that is not even taking into account the cost that will be incurred from new arrivals and if history is any guide if labor is allowed to inhabit the treasury benches there will be new unauthorized arrivals because the last time the labor party were in government we saw 800 boats and 50,000 unauthorized boat arrivals 8,000 children ended up in detention, and 2,000 children were in detention when we came to government. And tragically, more than 1,000 people lost their lives at sea. 17 new detention centres were open, and there was a huge uh, physical cost, emotional cost, and of course, budgetary cost. And the cost of Labor's failed border protection policies was $16 billion. $16 billion could build 1,000 primary schools, Mr Speaker. That's more than 10 schools in each electorate of those opposite, in Hotham, in Herbert, in Braddon, in Bass, in Brand. You could have more than 10 primary schools if you didn't have the cost of Labor's folly when it came to borders. $16 billion would build 100 new hospitals. That's a new hospital in every electorate of those sitting opposite. So, Mr Speaker, in contrast to the Labor Party, we put in place strong border protection policies that have worked, policies that have stopped the boats, policies that have allowed us to close detention centres, policies that have allowed us to save lives, policies that have allowed us to take every single child out of detention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Mr. Speaker, these are policies that have worked. These are policies that have made Australia safer. These are policies that Labor now wants to unwind. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's previous answer and acknowledge his support for the NDIS. But at 12.15 p.m. today, government vote, senators voted and divided against a disability royal commission. Is that still the position of the government? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I thought I made the government's position um, fairly clear in my answer to the last question. And I'd add this further. The NDIS Commission has strong investigation and regulatory powers and can take tough and appropriate action, including deregistration, banning orders and civil penalties. The NDIS Commission commenced operations in New South Wales and South Australia on 1 July 2018. It will commence in the ACT Northern Territory, Queensland, Tasmania, Victoria on 1 July 2019 and in Western Australia on 1 July 2020. At this point, Mr Speaker, there are the powers and the ability to address issues in this sector as we currently understand it, but we will always remain open to ideas and suggestions about how further support can be provided. The member for Gray. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is securing our borders and maintaining a strong border security and border protection policies and that have been so successful? And is the minister aware of any risk to this success? The Minister for Immigration has the call. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And, uh, as we all know, 
this government uh, inherited a humanitarian catastrophe from those op opposite. With 50,000 people arriving, with 8,000 children forcibly placed in detention, and most tragically of all, with 1,200 people uh, perishing at sea. If you look at Australia's post-war policy history, uh, it is very difficult to come across a more appalling example of failure by an Australian government. It was uh, extraordinary. But, Mr Speaker, what those opposite want to do now is destroy the successful system that this government has built to fix the mess that they created. And as I said yesterday, Mr Speaker, what those opposite want to do is, is apply a lower standard for people who transfer to Australia from Manus Island and Nauru than for every other person who comes to Australia under a visa, under Section 501 of the Migration Act. Now, under Section 501.6c of the Migration Act, Mr. Speaker, this is an important point. Uh, a visa can be re refused if, having regard to either or both of the following, the person's past and present criminal conduct, or the person's past and present general conduct, this person is not of good character. Now, that's very broad, Mr. Speaker. That applies to anyone coming here on a tourist visa, uh, someone who's coming here on a work visa. Uh, it applies to your cousin from Canada who's coming to visit. And if they do not meet that standard, they do not get a visa and they do not get to come to Australia. But that standard, Mr Speaker, would not apply to those coming from Manus and Nauru. And that is because of Labor's Amendment 14 to the legislation, Mr Speaker. Now, under this legislation, which imposes a very, very narrow uh, test on who can be excluded, there are so many examples of people for whom the minister could not stop their entry. A person who char has multiple charges uh, against them of se on sexual offences, for instance, a person alleged to be a drug dealer. And there's a whole other category that I think is really worth pausing and thinking about. And I'd really like it'd be interesting to see the opposition's uh, input on this point. What about, Mr Speaker, if we don't know someone's identity? Now, it turns out, Mr Speaker, that this is a significant issue in offshore processing. These people would not uh, be excluded under Labor's definition because they very clearly have not breached the clauses under Labor's Amendment 14, and the government would be required to bring those people to Australia despite not knowing their identity. And that is shameful, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, a message is being sent from the Senate to this House calling for a Disability Royal Commission. Is it still the government's position to oppose and vote against a Disability Royal Commission? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Leader of the Opposition would know, it is a decision of the executive government to commission a Royal Commission. And if the government uh, seeks to do that, then the government will do that. The member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations and the Minister for Women. Will the Minister please update the House on how the government is acting to keep vulnerable women and children safe, including through our humanitarian programs? The Minister for Jobs, Industrial Relations and Women. I thank the Minister for Ryan for her question and for her strong interest in this very important matter. As the Prime Minister has said, it is our duty as a government to keep Australians safe. And we take that duty incredibly seriously. Since 2015, the government has invested more than $420 million in initiatives to help keep women and children safe, including initiatives announced only this week that will help women with emergency accommodation when fleeing domestic and family violence, and also helping to keep those women who want to remain in their homes safe in their homes. The government, of course, takes the financial security of women very seriously as well, helping women to build their financial security through the Women's Economic Security Statement. Over $100 million of initiatives announced last year for the first time ever to help build women's financial resilience, capability and security. 
And Mr Speaker, it's very timely that the member for Ryan asks about humanitarian programs. As only this morning I had the great privilege, along with the Prime Minister, of attending the UN Women's Women's International Breakfast, Women's Day Breakfast today. And uh, we can be very proud as a country of the fact that we are one of only very few countries in the world that specifically supports the resettlement of women at risk of victimisation, harassment or serious abuse because of their gender through our Women at Risk program. But we can only do that if we control our borders. Controlling our borders means that we can offer security and safety to women like the 23-year-old Afghan woman who was sold by her father at the age of six years to a member of the Taliban. She was raped each and every day for a number of years. She bore four children and she was finally able to escape her circumstances from Pakistan and be able to resettle here in Australia thanks to our Women at Risk program. Sadly, her story is not unusual, but the government is helping women just like her. In fact, since 2013, more than 7,000 women and children have found safe refuge in our country because of our, our Women at Risk program. In fact, in the last financial year alone, 2,100 women and children have been able to find safe refuge here, which is more than at any other time in our history. Those opposite talk a lot about compassion, and they're very conspicuous in their talk about compassion, but real compassion is delivering safety and security, which is what we are doing, and those opposite the risk The Minister's it. time has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to his previous answer. Can the Prime Minister inform the House whether the Executive will implement a resolution of the Parliament such as the one which has already been carried in the Senate and will be voted on in the House? Prime Minister has the call. Again, Mr Speaker, if the government intends to initiate a Royal Commission into any matter, as we have indeed done uh, in relation to aged care sector, which includes the in-home care and the disability um, services support provided in residential aged care to young Australians, then we will initiate that process and we will take— we've, we've, uh, the question is when. We've already announced the Royal Commission into aged care. It's already happened. Yep, I was talking about Jager, the Royal Jager. Commission to aged care. That's what I was referring to. We've actually done it. We initiated that. I took that decision when I became Prime Minister and I initiated it. I don't recall the previous government doing that, Mr Speaker. I don't recall them doing that. In all their calls for royal commissions, I never heard them call for a royal commission. In no, no, no. I didn't hear them do that, Mr. Speaker. We the chose to do Prime that. Minister. I was just responding to interjection, Mr. Speaker. If they don't want to interject, fair mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. The leader of the opposition on a point of order. On direct relevance, my question was about a disability royal commission. The prime minister is in order. The prime minister has the call. Yeah. I was making the point, Mr. Speaker, that where the government seeks to put in place a royal commission, we will do that. We will draft the terms of reference. We will consult on it. We will issue it. That is a matter for the executive government to determine where the royal commissions are made. Those decisions are not made by the parliament. The parliament can pass resolutions. Member they can Graham, pass many resolutions. But under our constitution and the way the government works, the government is the one that in initiates royal commissions. We have been more than ready to call royal commissions in the past. Uh, we would be in the future. And, Mr Speaker, our focus at the moment is ensuring that we are establishing uh, the, uh, the National Dis Disability Insurance Commission. But I take the interjection, I take the interjection from the member. You better hurry. How arrogant has the Labor Party become about member the next Grindler. election, Mr Speaker? So sure, so sure they are of winning the next election that they call out in this way saying, well, you better do it because you'll be all done, Mr Speaker. So arrogant they have become, Mr Speaker. Now, you said it, Albo. The, 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 the Prime Minister, I'm just reminding him to refer to members by their correct titles. Uh, and the member for Graindler on a point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister knows full well I was referring to the fact that the resolution from the yeah. Senate will Member be back Grain here can soon. His seat. And Member for Grainler can resume his seat. The Prime Minister can resume his seat too.
the member for Wright. I'm just going to make an obvious point. Um, if people are worried about their interjections being misinterpreted, that is quite ironical. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Good. I'm quoting you. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. As I was saying, so arrogant have the Labor Party become that they think they can do whatever they like, and we're seeing it already in opposition, trashing our border protection laws even before they have an opportunity uh, to face an election, Mr. Speaker. The Australian people have seen this mob, Mr Speaker. They've seen them for what they are. And yes, there will be an election, there will be a decision, and I don't believe they will elect an arrogant Labor Party. The member for Tangney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Will the Minister inform the House how the government is able to create jobs and opportunity through investment in industry, science and technology? How would this investment be put at risk? by different approaches to budget management, including recklessly unravelling Australia's border protection regime. The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Tangney for his question. And I know how passionate he is about making sure that Australia has a strong economy. And by having a strong economy, we can actually grow at the jobs that we have already and build on our economy into the future. We are absolutely committed on this side of the House to growing jobs in industry, science and technology. And we understand that in order to do that, we must have a strong economy. We know that without a strong economy, families and businesses will suffer. And when they suffer, that has a direct impact on jobs. Now, we are committed on this side of the House to manufacturing. And there's some interesting statistics that I'd actually like to share, Mr. Speaker, at this point. When Labor was last in government, one in eight manufacturing jobs disappeared. In the last 12 months alone, the Liberal National Government has created more than 74,000 new manufacturing jobs. And we are able to do that for a number of reasons, including that we have worked hard and we have built a strong economy. And through doing that, we have been able to inspire confidence in small businesses and medium enterprises yeah. to invest in their businesses Maybe and to invest, of course, in their workforce and to grow those jobs. Now, we do know, Mr Speaker, that under Labor there was a multi-billion dollar blowout when they had a weak border protection policy. Now, what could those billions of dollars have been spent on? Clearly, they would have made a significant impact in industry, science and technology. But let me just concentrate on science to begin with. We have injected $1.5 billion into our science capability. We have put more money into science than when Labor did when they were in government. We have invested, including $97 million more into the CSIRO, $126 million more for ANSTO, $53 million more for the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Now, if billions of dollars have to go back into making sure that our borders are strong, it will have a significant and potentially devastating impact on our scientific research. I don't want to see that happen, and I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we continue to grow our science, our technology and our manufacturing industries in this country to make sure that we have the jobs for the future. Mr Speaker, one thing is absolutely clear, and that is that the Liberal National Government stops the boats. Yeah, yeah. Labor stops the jobs. Yeah. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister support a royal commission into the violence, abuse and neglect of Australians living with a disability? Yes or no? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I said when I first responded to this question that I had hoped there would be 
an approach to these issues and to supporting people with disabilities that wouldn't sort of get into this sort of partisan debate. I know what the Leader of the Opposition is doing, Mr Speaker. He's, he's seeking to create a point of tension and division in this parliament about the support and care provided to people with disabilities. Now, I will remain open to every single option there is to provide support to people with disabilities. And that begins with ensuring that we're implementing correctly and appropriately the National Disability Insurance Scheme to ensure that the commission that sits around that, that it has an ability to receive complaints and take action on those complaints, is, is working effectively across the nation and so that people with disability and their families and carers can get access uh, to the sorts of remedies and solutions that are required. I have already demonstrated my willingness to call a royal commission when it comes to the aged care sector to address uh, the very palpable uh, abuses and neglect and the very serious cases that we have seen in that sector. Most seriously, the Oakden scandal that occurred in South Australia in a, a government-run aged care facility by the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. A Labor government presided over the Oakden scandal. And, Mr. Speaker, the manifest failures more broadly in the aged care system I would like to see addressed through this aged care royal commission. Now, Mr. Speaker, I do not wish to draw this note of partisanship into this debate. I am open to every option to ensure the support for disabled Australians all around the country, as every budget I delivered as Treasurer demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate in my role as Prime Minister and with the Treasurer. Mr. Speaker. So, we are open to every option, but one thing we are not open to is playing politics with disabilities. The member for Moore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Personnel. Will the Minister update the House on the measures taken by the government to reduce the exposure of our ADF personnel to trauma associated with border protection operations? What assistance are we providing to those who have been exposed to trauma as a result of the deployment on border protection operations. The Minister for Defence personnel, I should say. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do thank the member for more for his question, and I thank him for the work he does to support veterans in his own electorate, but right, right throughout Western Australia. And, Mr. Speaker, it is often said that there is no greater service to our nation than to put on the uh, uniform of our navy, our army, our air force and to be willing to place yourself in harm's way to help those who can't necessarily help themselves. And historically, harm's way has normally meant conflicts abroad, whether it be uh, wartime or in peacekeeping missions. And in recent years, obviously, it's also included Afghanistan and Iraq. But as we all know, Mr Speaker, our ADF personnel can also be placed in harm's way much closer to home. On Operation Resolute, our ADF personnel have been deployed to protect our borders. And they can be exposed to dangers like when forming boarding parties to deal with unauthorised arrivals, often on boats which have been sabotaged, designed to sink, and often working in hazardous sea conditions. They are also deployed, Mr. Speaker, on search and rescue missions, looking for or hoping to uh, save people in peril of drowning at sea, but all too often recovering bodies from the sea. It is traumatic, Mr. Speaker. It is horrendous, and there are quite sickening scenes. And it does have an impact, Mr. Speaker. Our Department of Veterans Affairs is already helping people with PTSD and other claims directly linked to their service on border protection activities. And the government provides over $200 million annually to support those who have mental health issues. And I've got to say, Mr Speaker, there is a hidden cost to the people smugglers insidious trade. And as our ADF personnel and their families, it is the people that we put in harm's way who carry that burden for the rest of their lives if we let the people smugglers get back into business. And I want to quote from Senator Reynolds from the other place last night from her direct experience. And she said, let me say to everybody here, it won't be the senators in this place who have to recover the bloated corpses of babies and women mauled by the sharks. It will be the men and women of the Australian Border Force and the Australian Defence Force who have had to do it twice before. It won't be the members of the House of Representatives who will be comforting our defence and Border Force personnel who years later still wait with night terrors, reliving the horrors we knowingly inflicted on them. And I've got to say, Senator Reynolds speaks from her direct military experience. And I know uh, those opposite, last time they were in government, when they changed our border protection laws, it was full of good intentions. And I don't suggest there was any, for a second there was any malice intended. But it sent the wrong message, and the outcome was horrific. 
50,000 people arriving on 800 boats with 1,200 people tragically dying at sea. So, Speaker, I do urge those opposite to reconsider their position. Reconsider the direction they are taking right now. I fear they have started down a path which ends in more trauma and more lives lost, and I don't want to see the Australian Defence Force personnel placed in harm's way unnecessarily. And again, Mr Speaker, I'd like to take the opportunity to advise both our current and our former serving men and women of the services available through the Open Arms Counselling Service 24 hours a day, seven days a week on 1800 011 046. The member for Gorton. Thank you, Speaker. My question oh, is to the... No, I've already called the member for Gorton. My question, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services and refers to previous answers he, was, he has given in his current portfolio concerning the raids on the AW when TV cameras turned up before the police. How can the minister possibly stand by the answers he has given in this House when, according to sworn evidence, it was his office that ensured that TV cameras turned up to the raids before the police? The uh, Minister for Human Services. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. During my time as Justice Minister, I had a whole series of breathless shadow ministers coming to the dispatch box every time there was an investigation that had political implications, asking me what I knew, who said what when, and my answers have always been the same. My office and myself dealt with difficult information, dealt with sensitive information every single day. And we knew our responsibilities in relation to dealing with that information, and we upheld those responsibilities in all circumstances. Now, I was pleased to update the House yesterday about what this issue is actually about. There is one person in this chamber who has not answered any questions about whether their behaviour was lawful in relation to the conduct of the union that they ran at the time. Now, if the police were investigating me and I had nothing to hide, I would do everything I could to get them the information, the evidence that they require, to exonerate me from whatever allegation had been made. Now, if you were innocent, that is exactly what you would do. Now, if for 18 months you refused to provide that evidence, you did everything possible to stop the police from getting that evidence. How would you describe a person that behaved in that way? I would describe them as guilty. Guilty of hiding information from the police. Guilty of not doing the right thing when they were in charge of the union. Let's just say the CEO of a private company gave company money to an organisation that they were involved in, a political organisation that they were involved in, just gave them some company money. Then later on, they gave their own campaign. They gave themselves some company money. What would they say about that CEO? They would say, lock him up. That's what they would say. But then when it comes to the CEO of a union, they, of course, apply completely different standards of behaviour. Now, the Leader of the Opposition don't get one of your lesser minions to ask questions about this. If you've got something to ask me, get up and ask it yourself. And while you're at it, explain why you don't want this evidence going to the Australian Federal Police. The member for Indi. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I refer to my question yesterday and acknowledge the release of the government's response to the regions at the Ready Report. The response sadly confirms that regional policy is uncoordinated without planning or strategy. Prime Minister, traditionally people in regional Australia have supported the government, but as outlined in the Rusted Off book, clearly that is changing as we are continually treated second-class citizens, and it's confirmed by this response. Prime Minister, as you prepare for the budget, will you personally commit to, res to read this government response? and undertake to give regional Australia the policies and resources we deserve to take our place with this great nation. 
The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, yesterday the member asked me whether we had committed to a white paper on regional Australia. And as you'd know, in that response, we have committed to do exactly that, which is exactly what the member had been advocating uh, to this government uh, that we should do that, and that is exactly what the government is going to be doing. And the, the other thing I'd say to the member is this, and that is to continue to fund the record levels that we are as a government to services, not just in metropolitan Australia but in rural and regional Australia, the one thing that will continue to support that is the economic plan that we continue to operate. In this country, as a result of the economic plan of this government, we have seen record growth in employment. We have seen businesses started, established all over the country. We have lowered taxes. We have, we have provided a $5.6 billion investment into drought proofing and providing support to Australians in rural and regional areas that are afflicted by the drought, with one of the most, I'd argue, most comprehensive responses to drought um, that this nation has seen. And I commend Minister Litterproud and I commend uh, Major General Day for the work that he's been doing, working with rural and regional communities all around the country. And, and you're right, I commend the, the member. Uh, for New England as well, and his responsibilities as the special envoy out there working with rural and regional communities all around the country. So whether it's the inland rail, whether it's our investment in regional universities, whether it's our investment in mobile towers, as the, the Deputy Prime Minister has reminded us, our government will continue to invest in the infrastructure, the services and the support that rural and regional Australians depend on and are represented by the countless number of rural and regional members that sit on the coalition benches here, Mr Speaker, who are the most, the most voracious in advocates for the people of rural and regional Australia. And there is not a day that goes by, Mr Speaker, in my responsibilities, Prime Minister, that my rural and regional members are not raising these issues and are championing the cause of rural and regional Australia. And that is why, under our government, rural and regional Australia is getting the level of services support that they have only seen under this government, Mr Speaker, at those record levels. And they'll continue to receive it. And I want to thank the members for their wonderful advocacy as rural and regional members to ensure that it will always have a voice in government here in Australia. Yeah. The member for McKellar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Will the Attorney General update the House on how the government is supporting a strong justice system through strong and consistent border protection policies? How would other approaches impact Australia's ability to scrutinise transferees from Nauru for criminal justice and national security purposes? The Attorney General has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And Mr. Speaker, yesterday we noted reporting of a person on Manus Island who is charged with four counts of sexual penetration of a minor against the PNG Summary Offences and Crimes Against Children Act. And today we've informed the House of an individual currently in regional processing who has been charged with assaulting a medical officer who has a history of violence and who is also alleged to have been charged with murder in another country. We have informed the House that the Labor changes, the Labor laws, now mean that the Minister has no discretion to refuse the transfer of individuals such as those two that we've mentioned. But perhaps an even more fundamental problem relates to the types of assessments that actually allow our agencies to unearth <coughs> information of that kind. Whether it is trying to find whether someone has behaved in a previously unlawful way or whether or not they may be a security risk, that is a resource-intensive process that takes an enormous amount of time. And another very fundamental difference that has now emerged because of the Labor laws ran through this parliament on Tuesday night is that previously the Minister and the Department of Home Affairs controlled the timing of medical transfers. Home Affairs now faces the task of assessing up to 1,000 cases of people in a time frame that is effectively determined by a very small group of doctors. And we reasonably believe that we will be forced with a flood of about 300 immediate Labor transfer cases. Now, assessing someone, as the Minister of Immigration has noted, of uncertain origin as to whether or not they have engaged in criminality or whether or not they pose a security risk to the Australian people is a difficult, resource-intensive and process that takes time. And a case in the High Court yesterday demonstrated this very clearly, the case of M47. It was about an individual who arrived in Australia in 2010. They have been an unlawful non-citizen since then. 
They variously claim to be a citizen of West Sahara, Algeria, Spanish Canary Islands and to be stateless. That person used various false passports indicating citizenship of Gaza, Israel, Iraq. Nine years later, we still do not know the country of origin of that person. We still don't know that after nine years' worth of investigation. And this House needs to understand, as the Australian people need to understand, how long it is that Labor's laws now give ASIO to assess those 300, those 1,000 cases, as to whether or not they might present a security risk to the Australian people, and how long is that time frame? 72 hours. We are staring down. We are staring down the potential to have up to 300 requirements to assess 300 individuals for their potential security risk at once in a 72-hour period because of your changes to the law. The attorney's time has concluded. The member for Gorton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Human Services and refers to previous answers he has given in his current portfolio concerning the raids on the AW when TV cameras turned up before the police. Can he confirm that no person who at the relevant time worked in his office leaked those raids to the media? I'm just pondering whether that question's in order. Um, yeah, no, I don't believe it is, actually. No, I don't believe it is. So it, it goes to I'm happy to hear from the manager of opposition business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, the sorry to the point of order. Yep. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the the question refers to previous answers. Yep. In those previous answers, the minister has referred to the raids, has referred to uh, the issue of media being alerted, and has referred and has referred to the work of his own office. Mm. They are the elements of the question. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. I'm going to allow it. Well, I'll hear, I'll hear from the leader of the, op uh, the leader of the house, and if he's Mr. got something Speaker. ultra compelling, I'll. Uh... Well, I think it's compelling, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the There's minister never any be doubt asked, about this. The minister can be asked. Uh, <laughs> the minister could, for example, be asked a question about whether he's made inquiries of his staff mm. about whether they have done a particular action. Well, I don't but think he, so. That's yeah. not what the question mm. is. Mm. But he can't actually answer what has been done by somebody else that's not within his knowledge. Let me just hear the question again. Is it okay? Yeah. From the beginning, speak. From the beginning, or just the last. Well, part? don't do it backwards. No. <laughs> Best place to start. I'm happy to do it forwards, <laughs> but I'm happy to do the last question, which is. No, just to the I issue. think I'll hear the whole lot. Okay, that's no okay. problem. My question. It's okay. Thanks, Speaker. Yeah. My question is to the Minister for Human Services and refers to previous answers he has given in his current portfolio concerning the raids on the AWU when TV cameras turned up before the police. Mm. Can he confirm that no person who at the relevant time worked in his office leaked those raids to the media? Yeah, I've t I, think, I think the member for Gordon. Look, I am going to allow the question. I do take the point that the Leader of the House has, has made, but the point is the Minister can ad address it in any way he wants. And I think the link to previous answers um, means it, it, it is in order. So I am, I am going to allow it after all the Minister. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer this question because I've got a lot more to say about this. <laughs> a lot more to say about this because this goes to the character of the leader of the opposition. Yeah. This goes to the character of the man who wants to be prime minister of this country. Yeah. This goes to the character of the man who already is measuring up the curtains of the office, thinking about how he's going to redecorate the lodge and how he operates if he were to get into that position of responsibility. Because the last position of responsibility, the job he had prior to entering parliament, was running the Australia's Workers' Union, the AWU, the union that since October in 2017 has been running interference, trying to stop the Australian Federal Police from getting the evidence that they require to pursue their investigations about wrongdoing within the union. And it goes directly to his behaviour when he was running that union. 
Can you just take union members' money and give it to whoever you like, including yourself? Including yourself. That's what he did with union members' Minister money. Minister will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Um, Mr Speaker, I respect that there is a wide range allowed when there is a, a large preamble, uh, but this question is quite tight in the specifics of what it asks and what it refers Members to. Members on my right. No, I'm just going to point out to the manager of opposition business as I was pondering the question. This is the problem in referring to previous answers, and that's exactly what the minister is doing. The minister has the call. Well, uh, as I said, I'm very happy to continue to take a lot of questions on this. I understand question time has been extended, and I'm very happy to continue discussing what I know about this matter, which is quite a lot, actually. <laughs> and I know a lot about political investigations in this place. And when I was Justice Minister, I was responsible for overseeing many of them. And we always knew how to deal with information in relation to those particularly sensitive cases. And what could be more sensitive than wrongdoing by the man who wants to be the Prime Minister of Australia? What could be more sensitive than that? Deputy Leader now, when, the opposition. He, when he was running the AWU, and this is what the police were investigating, there is allegations that union members' money was used in a cavalier fashion, given out to get up, given out to his own campaign fund, and he has never once taken the opportunity to actually say why he won't allow that evidence to be examined by the police. Treasurer. Now, that is not the actions of somebody that doesn't have anything members to hide. Members on my right. The Minister Mr. for Speaker, Agriculture. We know how this man would operate as Prime Minister of Australia because he's told us he will run the country like he ran the union. And if that's the case, we know how much more we've got to fear from a Labor government. Yeah. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister update the House how a strong economy enables the government to subsidise life-changing medicines for Australian patients living with lung cancer? Is the Minister aware of any different approaches that resulted in patients being delayed access to medicines recommended by the experts? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to uh, thank the member for Goldstein, who has been a, a great advocate for Griefline in his electorate, a great advocate for the listing of new medicines, and has also been a great advocate though, for action which will help deliver a strong economy. He knows his economic history, and uh, I think he would know the history of the PBS and some of the things that have happened in recent years. But interestingly, yesterday I realised that there are some who don't know that history. I read a transcript from the member for Ballarat who was asked a question at the press club about whether or not they would list medicines recommended by the PBAC if Labor were ever in government again. She said, look, it's been frankly terrific to see that the government, our government, that is, has been listing medicines. And then she went on to say, in the same way that Labor did in government, and then went on to guarantee that they would list the medicines as we did in government. That was a bit of a surprise to me because I had to dig out the 2011 budget statement, and it was a statement authorised by the assistant treasurer, amongst others. And the assistant treasurer is now the leader of the opposition. And that statement said, due to fiscal circumstances, the listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. As the Consumer Health Forum and 59 other organisations said at the time, affordable medicines and vaccines that save and prolong lives are being denied to some of the most vulnerable, chronically ill Australians by a short-sighted decision by the government to disregard the recommendations of the PBAC. That is what they did when they were in government. Fortunately, fiscal circumstances are strong under this government, and they will always be strong. That's why. When the PBAC recommended the listing of Tegriso in mid-December, we were able to announce a month later that that medicine would be listed as of the 1st of February. And Tegriso is a wonderful medicine. It's a new medicine uh, which treats lung cancer for those with a genetic condition that causes it, people who have never smoked in the overwhelming majority of cases. And what that means is that, as the Prime Minister and the Member for Deakin and myself were able to say on the day when we met 
with Bruno, who has been through the clinical trials on this and who has his life back and is able to be a dad uh, because of this medicine, it means that 400 other patients in a $69 million uh, listing will save up to $90,000 per year through this new medicine that is on the PBAC. And that means they have a shot at life. And that means they have a shot at being their full, uh, their full selves. And under us, if the PBAC lists it, we will always list the new medicines, and we'll do that because we have a strong economy. The member for Ballarat. My question is to the Prime Minister. According to this list provided by the Department of Health this week, there are at least 52 medicines that have been recommended by the independent experts for listing on the PBS, but not listed by this government. This includes drugs for cancer, Parkinson's disease and a range of other life-threatening conditions. How can this government boast about the PBS while it's Member delaying Bowman. access to life-saving drugs? The Minister for Health. Tell us 1900. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And nothing good, uh, could give me more pleasure than to answer this question. Because of all the things that this government has done in its time which represent the delivery of a strong economy and the translation of that into essential services, it has been the listing of new medicines. New medicines for cystic fibrosis, new medicines for spinal muscular atrophy, new medicines for lung cancer, for skin cancer, for so many other different conditions. And in particular, and in particular I want to compare that with some of the things that the previous government did. They denied the listing and they deferred the listing for Simbacort for the treatment of severe asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for Fragmin for the formation of blood, uh, blood clots and to treat deep vein thrombosis, and endometriosis and in vitro fertilisation medicines. And as they said at the time, Due to fiscal circumstances, the listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. And that was when the Leader of the Opposition was the Assistant Treasurer. And not once has he ever explained why they made that decision. Not once has he ever stood and rose and talked to the public as to why he believed it was fair, why he believed it was reasonable to make those deferrals. Now, let me deal with some of the things that the, uh, that the member for Ballarat uh, has asserted, because I've done a little, bit, a little bit of analysis and a little bit of an assessment. And you know what? We've looked at the sorts of things that they've talked about, and when they stopped listing medicines, there was an average of 14.1 months of delay. Uh, in the cases that they have, uh, they have defined on previous things that we've assessed, the highest uh, average was about eight months, and what we have done is be able to bring it forward to under three months for Kiskali, for Spinraza, for Kaleidico, for Orkambi, and to Grisso at, uh, at a month in listings. So what we have done is bring these forward, and we have seen an interesting example. There was an interesting example that the member cited, because the last time she actually went to talk about a specific drug was when she referred to a decision of the BBAC in relation to a uh, PBAC recommendation with regards to a vaccine. I had a look at that, and you know what? It turned out it was a proposal for pneumococcal vaccine. What she didn't understand, because I can only think that it was understanding, not willful misleading, is that it then had to go back to the, it then had to go back to the regulators after a two-year assessment process. And so when pneumococcal is finally approved by the PBAC, we will list it. But it hasn't been approved, and therefore, when it is finally approved, we'll list it as we do with everything, as opposed to this side, which made shameful decisions to defer the listing of new medicines. The member for Ballarat is seeking to table the document. I am member seeking to table the list of 52 medicines that this government has failed to list, including some that have not been listed. No, for the well member over for Ballarat months. just seeks leave. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The member for Robertson. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. Will the Minister update the House how a strong economy allows the government to invest in Australia's defence industry and how this keeps Australians safe and secure? The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
On Monday of this week, I had the pleasure of joining with the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence as we commissioned the construction of 12 new submarines for our nation. An investment in new capability for our country, an investment in thousands of jobs, Australian jobs using Australian steel and being built in this country. That's what you can do when you have the budget under control and you can invest in making sure that our nation's borders are strong and that our nation is secure. And to go to the member for Robertson's question, because I know she's passionate about border protection and the security of our nation, like all of us on this side, all of us invested in making the hard decisions to restore the budget and make sure we can keep our nation secure. But it stands in very stark contrast to the Australian Labor Party. Because not only was 1989 the last year that the Australian Labor Party ran a budget surplus, but incidentally, 1989 was the last time that the Australian Labor Party commissioned a new build of a vessel when it came to our defence industry. In fact, last time Labor was in power, for the six years that they were in control of this nation's security, they did not commission a single vessel. They ran budget deficits and they were not able to invest in Aussie jobs or make sure that our nation was secure. And the reason was, Mr Speaker, the reason was because their priorities were all at sea. And their priorities were all at sea because we saw a complete blowout in the protection of our borders. We saw more than 50,000 illegal arrivals to our country, sadly more than 1,200 fatalities. We saw more than 10,200 people in detention, of which around 2,000 were children. And they spent billions upon billions upon billions of dollars trying to clean up the mess that they caused when they tinkered with our nation's laws. So at the very time that the Liberal and National Government is investing an extra $200 billion making our country secure, boosting our defence force, providing maximum protection for our men and women in uniform and investing in Australia's defence industry, at that very time the Labor Party has once again put all of that in jeopardy by adopting a posture on border protection that weakens our nation's border and, importantly, threatens the budget position of our nation, which completely erodes any ability to be able to ensure, if they were elected, that they could continue to invest in our defence force. The simple fact is this. It takes a Liberal and National Government to protect our borders. It takes a Liberal and National Government to restore our budget. It takes a Liberal and National Government to invest $200 billion back into defence the defence. The Minister's time jobs. has concluded. The Leader of the Opposition. Oh, my question is to the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he has decided that today's question time will continue longer than any other day in the 45th Parliament? in order to prevent the House from voting on a royal commission into abuse to people living with disabilities. Members on my left, the Prime Minister, the member for Lawler, is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr Speaker, what a declaration of surrender from the Leader of the Labor Party. When is the Leader of the Opposition ever wanted to shut down question time, Mr Speaker, when you've got a government which is happy to stand here, be questioned on our record, be questioned Talk on our achievements, be questioned on the plans that we have for Australia. We're happy to answer questions on this all day, Mr Speaker, because we're proud of what we're doing as a government, and we know what we're achieving for the country. We have the plans for Australia, Mr Speaker, whether it's for our stronger economy or keeping Australia safe and secure. Mr Speaker, earlier in the week, Earlier in the week, we did have to cut question time shorter because of the important matters that we were dealing with on indulgence. And, Mr. Speaker, why would the leader of the Labor Party not want to take the opportunity of holding the government to account? I can tell you why, Mr. Speaker, because he's had a shocking week. Mr. He has had a shocking week in this chamber because he knows, with his rollover on border protection, with him showing the nation just the weakness that beats within his heart that, Mr Speaker, he does not want to come into this chamber and debate these issues with the government. Not once have we had a question since their apparent great victory the other night about how these new laws will operate. 
Not once have we heard from them. So these new laws where we want to weaken the border protection, which the Labor Party have championed, how much will it cost? What will it mean for national security? What has the National Security yeah. Committee decided, Mr Speaker? Well, we've been answering those questions in this place because the other day they chopped off debate because they didn't want to hear the answers. Answers which said that ministerial decisions to say no to a transfer are automatically overturned by a panel, Mr Speaker, even if the panel has not yet been formed. And we had the ludicrous nature the other day as the Leader of the Opposition sought to uh, absolve himself of responsibility with absurd amendments to a bill which says now this panel of doctors has to be a panel of volunteer doctors, Mr Speaker. What's next? The National Security Committee is going to be made up by a panel of voluntary dentists, Mr Speaker, or any other medical professional, because the Labor Party aren't prepared to take national security seriously in this place. I began this week at the National Press Club setting out our plans to keep Australians safe and secure. If the Labor Party don't have any questions about it, Mr Speaker, well, that just shows how hollow and vacuous and weak they are when it comes to national security. The member for Petrie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Will the minister please update the House on steps the government is taking to ensure that our borders are secure? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to border protection which could put Australians at risk? The Minister for Immigration. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr Speaker. Well, we know those opposite destroyed our border security with tragic humanitarian consequences. We know that we fixed it. We're the ones that fixed it, Mr Speaker. We got the 2,000 kids out of detention. We stopped the boats. We saved Australian taxpayers billions of dollars. And now they want to come along and trash it again. Because on Tuesday, uh, Mr. Speaker, they rushed through this parliament laws which will unravel offshore processing, which is so, which is so critical to our border security. Now, under this uh, process, uh, as the Prime Minister said, any two doctors anywhere in Australia who have never been to Manus Island or Nauru can start a process to bring people to Australia. So two doctors from DAPTO can effectively overrule doctors who are actually on Manus Island and Nauru. Now, if the minister says uh, it doesn't agree with that, it goes to a medical panel, and that panel can overrule the minister on, on any grounds uh, save the very, very, very narrow grounds under Labor's Amendment 14. So what that means, Mr Speaker, is in short order a very large number of people will be transferred to Australia from Manus Island and Nauru. That necessitates the reopening of Christmas Island at a cost to taxpayers that we estimate as greater than $1 billion. That is what the Labor Party has done, Mr Speaker. And then the question is, they say that they put in safeguards about the people who are transferred. And that's why I draw your attention again, Mr Speaker, to Amendment 14 that, that uh, defines uh, the people who can come to Australia under Labor's amendment. So uh, it's very narrow. There's no character test outside of the very narrow uh, criminal uh, test of 12 months conviction or more. So a backpacker from Norway, Mr Speaker, a backpacker from Norway has to pass the substantive character test under Australian law, but people coming from Manus Island or Nauru don't. Now, how can that be fair or appropriate, Mr Speaker? Why should someone who's coming to be a skilled worker in the goldfields of Western Australia have to pass a much higher character test than someone who's coming from Manus or Nauru? And also, Mr Speaker, why on earth should someone who's coming from Manus or Nauru not have to uh, at least assist the government in, in verifying their identity? Now, if someone is not willing to assist the government in verifying their identity, that raises very serious character concerns. They can be dealt with under the Migration Act generally, but they cannot be dealt with under Labor's Amendment 14. It is a disgraceful amendment. It puts Australia's border security at great risk, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you. My questions to the Prime Minister. I refer to his answer to my previous question. Isn't the reason that the Prime Minister has extended question time is that he knows that he's lost control of the House of Representatives and he's fearful that a majority of members will support a royal commission into the disability sector to keep people of Australians with disabilities safe. The Prime Minister has a call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, that is not the case. And I'm not, and I'm not prepared to engage in creating a partisanship around that issue. I'm not, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I refer the member raises the issue of question time today. It is true that there, there was a question time back in 2009. I remember it. Senator Steele John. Senator Steele John. Senator Steele John, you will not interject in this chamber. Prime Minister will proceed. Yet yeah, Prime Minister will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The opportunity is there before the Labor Party to raise questions before the government of matters of government policy and the government's achievements and plans. The Leader of the Opposition is basically surrendering, saying he's got nothing to say. He's got no alternative views. He's a hollow man, Mr. Speaker. When actually he has given the, been given the opportunity to stump up in this place and ask questions, Mr. Speaker, he wants to run away. He doesn't want a question time. Now I remember some pretty long question times when Kevin Rudd was prime minister. They used to go on for hours, and he used probably it was only one question that he probably answered during that time. Thankfully, there are now time limits as a result of when the Labor Party used to go on for minutes and times of, of immemorial, Mr. Speaker. But here there is an opportunity for the opposition if they're serious. And the government members are quite happy to raise these matters because there is much that we have done. And particularly what is coming under scrutiny today is the weakness of the, the Labor Prime Party. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order? No, not a point of order, Mr Speaker, a procedural motion. In accordance with Standing Order 66. No, the, the Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. He will not do that midway through an answer. No, you've, you've, you've now flagged what you're trying to do. You're not going to interrupt someone answering a question, otherwise it would never end. And you'll have procedural motions on your questions. The Prime Minister will continue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I remind the House that it was the Labor Party today that did not want to have a matter of public importance debate. That is normally the practice of this House at this time. Not only do they not want to have question time, Mr Speaker, they do not even want to debate a matter of public importance of their own nomination. Ms. Speaker, I mean, how bankrupt has the opposition become, both on policy and any other terms, when they can neither identify an issue they want to debate in the House and don't even want to ask questions of the government? Mr. Speaker, if the Labor Party can't manage opposition, how on earth will they manage government if they were given the chance? The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Sorry, the, I did indicate to the manager of opposition business. So the Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 66H, oh, sorry, G, um, I move that the business of the day be called on. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, on a point of order, Standing Order 66G, which is that the business of the day be called on, uh, refers, of course, specifically to the only other standing order in the uh, standing orders, which is Standing Order 46, where that uh, phrase is used, which is Standing Order 46E, that the business of the day be called on because it relates specifically to being able to call on business during the matter of public importance and not at any other time of the day. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm going to address this issue. I mean, you can you can have it a, a, a tater tape uh, on the on the on the subject behind the chair if you want to. Um, let me be very clear about this. Um, when it comes to question time and other matters during the day, my responsibility is to call it on. That's why there is a procedure. Okay? I'm going to address this at, in some detail. No, you can calmly listen. That's, that's, that's a good thing to do. And I'm just going to flag exactly my point. So that's why I say in accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has expired. There's no hard finish 
for question time. The Leader of the House's point is right, and that is when there's a, a, ma a matter of public importance uh, before the House, the Leader of the House can move that, uh, uh, you know, the motion that, that was put there. Page 545 of the practice makes it very clear that the end of question time is the prerogative of the Prime Minister. It's, that's always been the case. There's not, hang on, no, I'm addressing the House. Page 545 of practice makes it very clear that ending question time is the prerogative of the Prime Minister. There is no set end time, and indeed, as I think the Prime Minister might have indicated, they have gone for various lengths of time, and they, they have over the years. And that's been the case even though there's, there's a normal period where questions start and end. But they have gone longer. And in fact, on the 4th of February 2009, question time went for 126 minutes. It's in, it's in footnote 22 on that page. No one can call question time to an end other than the Prime Minister or the Duty Minister. And th my responsibility as Speaker is to this House. I did that on some complex matters the other day, and I'm not going to have devices to try and end something like question time when the practice and the convention is very clear, very clear indeed. Sure, manager opposite business. Uh, thank you for, for the, the explanation you've given, Mr Speaker. The issue that I sought to raise and that I yes. seek to simply put before you is this is a procedural motion that is put in two parts of standing orders. It is put once, as the Leader of the House referred to, with respect to the MPI. It is also put as a procedural motion under Standing Order 66. And where it appears under Standing Order 66, that standing order begins with these. Uh, so, um, yeah, that explains that a member may only interrupt another member to do the following. It does not have further limitations on the MPI under that standing order. And what I'm seeking to raise as a point yep. of order yep. is standing orders provide this to be moved in two different circumstances. I accept, and I'm not raising as a point of order, that the Prime Minister doesn't have the right to delay as long as he wants, saying that further questions should be placed on the notice paper. What I'm putting to you, Mr Speaker, is the House has the right, just as these other motions can be moved during question time, for example, E, that the member be no longer heard, is from time to time moved during question time. Similarly, G, that the business of the day be called on. There is no, no ruling, sorry, there is no words under Standing Order 66 that prevent the House from making that decision if it is so moved. And that's why I'm wishing to move it. I'm going to hear from the Leader of the House. I'm, I'm unmoved on the subject, and I'll hear from the Leader of the House and then I'll address it again. And uh, just before I hear from the Leader of the House, I'm reminding members that my, my role and my responsibility is to allow members to participate in these debates, and question time is not just one of them, it's an important one, and the conventions in this place matter. Before I even hear from the Leader of the House, I'm going to say it is very clear when the, the business of the day can be called on. It is very clear when it is called on, and I'm going to be as generous as I can. I'm going to say uh, saying that is a standalone power when it relates to Standing Order 46 is wrong. It's either, frankly, a misunderstanding of the Standing Orders, and if that were the case, you'd be able to walk to the dispatch box and give me an example of when it had been done. It's never been done, and I think, frankly, it's not anything the House should even be entertaining. I'm saying that strongly. I upheld the rights of all members the other day, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it again today.
the Leader of the House has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've been very, very clear, and I'm sure the House understands your position. Just to the point of order that the Manager Opposition Business raised, in the House of Representatives practice, uh, it says uh, it is entirely within the discretion of the Prime Minister or the senior minister present as to whether question time will take place and, if so, for how long. There is absolutely no ambiguity about the length being entirely within the discretion of the Prime Minister. And as the question time has begun, it can only end when he or the senior minister uh, who is present decide that it is at the end, because that's very, very clear on the House of Business Practice, page 545. Can I just say something? I mean, I, I know what's going on here. I'm not unfamiliar with procedure or what's going on. Can I make it easy? The message you're worried about hasn't even arrived. It hasn't. I'm just telling you. No, members on my right, it hasn't arrived. And even if it, even if it had arrived, in the ordinary course of events, it wouldn't be dealt with today. Now, look, let me make a point about the Senate. Sure, they send messages over, and they get dealt with. But you know, I'm not, I mean, it's not here. That's the fact. So we can argue about this till 4.30, if you want to. I think a better use of time would allow question time to continue. And why don't we give some of those members that don't get a question a go? That's what I think should happen. The Manager of Opposition Business. Your turn, Members on my right. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, if I can only raise one aspect of what you've just said, yep. which is the concept of whether or not me moving that resolution was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are in an unprecedented situation today. Members on my right. Where Members on my right. Yes, yes. Where we are waiting for a message in a situation where the, part, where the government does not control the majority of the House and is using question time and its length as a way of trying to prevent the House from making a decision. And there are a number of things that have happened this term that have happened for the first time in the history of this House. Yep. And the fact that it is without precedent, there is a reason why no one has sought to move this before. Now, you're right. Um, just hang on one. The, um, you're right, there's a lot of things that have happened, but I'll tell you one thing that's not going to happen. We're not going to start inventing standing orders. That's, no, members on my right. And another thing that hasn't happened is the absence of an MPI. So I think now I've got the attention of the House and everyone's here. No, the member for, member for Boothby, there's lots of time. I think we've made that point. I'm going to address a couple of points. Um, there is a misunderstanding that's of, of the standing orders. It is. Now, I'd forgotten it. I know why. You know, from 2009, question time going for 126 minutes, I, I had. <laughs> right? And uh, you probably had as well. Um, but another thing that's happened, and I might as well address this now, is um, the absence of a matter of public importance today. And House of Reps practice also notes, um, although members on both sides of the House are entitled to propose the matter, uh, and occasionally, very occasionally, a government member has been selected, uh, it's now essentially the convention, since we're talking to conventions, that the opposition uh, lodge the MPI, or indeed if a crossbencher lodges it, they do that in, in consultation with the official opposition. Given there was no MPI lodged today, this has deprived the House of an opportunity and deprived other members of an opportunity to have a matter of public importance. Question time is an important part of the day, so is the matter of public importance. It is meant to be just that, the biggest debate of the day. So I'm very disappointed in that, I have to say that, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage members no, no, I'm going to encourage members from both sides of the House to submit matters to me, and I'll consider them. That's how I feel at the moment, but uh, I'm happy to hear from the manager of opposition business. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I do think this is important for the House to understand with respect to the MPI, that what has previously occurred... No, can the member for Karangamite... Cease interjecting. 
what has previously occurred with respect to the MPI mm. on a number of occasions, not a large number, mm. is when there has been a compelling reason for debate, the MPI has been withdrawn either by leave or by the person who wrote to you not being in the chamber at the time. It had been pointed out to me that that process was less respectful to you. And, Mr Speaker, you're aware that that had been pointed out to me? Yes. And that is the reason that that advice was followed and an MPI not being submitted at all, because of the genuine significance of the resolution that was coming from the Senate, because of course, as you'd be aware, if that resolution was reported at 4.15, yep. the procedures to start to deal with it would be interrupted at 4.30 and it would disappear from the, no, from the paper yep. and the House would not be given a decision to, an opportunity to make a decision. So if there is any sense at all that not submitting an MPI was a breach of convention, I simply ask you to I, I simply remind you of the advice I was given as to what was the most respectful way to deal with your office. And in answer to the manager of opposition business, I respect his intention, um, but I'm going to point out again, I don't think, and he and I can have discussions about this, probably not now, we can have other discussions, might be better to have them in my office, but I don't think it is right for this House, for an official opposition now or into the future, to have hostage of the MPI. If two matters had been submitted to me um, today, by convention, I would have chosen the opposition one. But if one matter had been, if the opposition didn't put one in and one came before me, we'd have had an MPI. So I think he has to ponder that point. The MPI is not the choice of the opposition, it's in the standing orders of this House. That's my difficulty. And I'm just going to leave that thought with him. Uh, if I'd had two, of course, the convention would be to pick the opposition. But I'm not going to let the opposition, now or into the future, decide whether or not an MPI occurs. So that's a problem we've got to solve. We don't need to solve it now. I'm aware of your tactical considerations. I'm just aware of what needs to be done in this House, and that's why I was very blunt. If you're waiting for the message, it hasn't come. Even if it had come by now, it wouldn't be before me through the processes that occur, and it wouldn't ordinarily be dealt with today. Now, the Australian Senate can pass messages. Of course it can, and it can send them here, and the House will deal with them. But processes are not going to be altered uh, to suit what might be a, a tactical issue of the day. Now, I'm just telling you openly, candidly, I've checked with the clerk, the message has not come from the Senate. It is not here. Okay? And so I think all of the issues that you're concerned about, uh, they're, not go they're not going to arise today. We're in question time. I think we just should move on. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on steps the government is taking to strengthen Australian citizenship and protect our nation from foreign fighters and other non-terrorists? Is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches which could put Australians at risk? The yeah. Minister for Home Affairs. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the honourable member for her question. Uh, like all Australians, we've watched on in horror as Australians have fallen victim to terrorist attacks in our country. We pay tribute to our law enforcement and intelligence agencies for keeping Australians safe. They've been able to thwart some 14 attempted attacks in our country. And one of the big concerns and threats we have as a Western democracy, Mr Speaker, it, is the fact of people returning from the Middle East, foreign fighters that have left our shores, in many cases Australian citizens, so they have a right to return back to our country once they've finished in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it is that they might be fighting in the name of ISIL, for example. So this government has 
taken strong decisions in relation to the ways in which we can keep Australians safe. And from my perspective, and I believe with the support of the Australian people, we have done whatever is constitutionally and legally proper and appropriate to keep those people from our shores. I don't want them coming back, Mr Speaker. If they're an Australian citizen under the Constitution, they have the ability to come back. And that is the way the law is. And some people say, why would we allow these terrorists to come back and potentially cause a catastrophic event in our country? So we have to get the balance right. And I believe that we have got the balance right, Mr Speaker. We've seen 12 dual nationals because of their actions in relation to terrorist type activity lose their Australian citizenship. And from my perspective, that is a good thing. Yes. Australia is safer because of that. We've had a number of people who have been killed in the Middle East who have been fighting in the name of ISIL, for example. And frankly, that is a good outcome as well because those people will not return to our country to cause harm or to cause a mass casualty event in our country. So imagine my surprise, Mr Speaker, when this week the Labor Party backflipped on a bipartisan position to support the government to strengthen the citizenship laws that would make it harder for those terrorists to come back into our country. Imagine my surprise when the member for Isaacs, who said in the media today that, frankly, he's not interested in supporting the government's position. I mean, why would he say that, Mr Speaker? It seems to me that every utterance that comes from the shadow Attorney-General, the man who would be the Attorney-General, the first law officer in a shortened government, every time he has the opportunity to stand up for a victim, he chooses not to. He stands up instead for the criminal. Every time he has the chance to stand up for strong border security, does he do that? No. He stands up for the people smugglers, Mr Speaker. The member for Isaacs need to real, needs to realise he is paid by the Australian people and he needs to act in Australia's interests. And this week on border protection and national security, he's failed the that test. The minister's time has concluded. The member for Mayo. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services. Minister, why won't you save delays, heartache and costly appeals and just let NDIS participants see their draft plan before it's processed by the NDIA? And I'd like to acknowledge Senator Jordan Steelejohn, who is here today, who is a tremendous advocate for people with disabilities. The Minister for Families and Social Services. Well, I do thank the member for Mayo and I acknowledge her a strong interest in the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is, of course, transforming the experience of Australians with disability, with some 250,000 Australians with disability now receiving support. Uh, and, of course, a critical element of the experience that participants have with the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme is their plan, developing the plan and then, of course, acting upon the plan. The plan will typically have within it a range of supports that are funded and then, of course, under the principle of choice and control, <coughs> it's open to the participant uh, to go out uh, to choose people to provide those support elements and uh, spend the, the money that's allocated in the plan. Now, of course, it is important that uh, we have a process under which there's close engagement and consultation between the NDIS participant or their uh, parents or carers, where that's relevant, and with typically their local area coordinator. So that's a process which occurs. It's often an iterative process. There's now a face-to-face -face meeting in every instance. That's something that's been in place from October of last year. And what's also important is the work that we're doing to improve the participant pathways. So, for example, dedicated pathways for uh, psychosocial disability. And, uh, that allows specific expertise to be brought, brought, brought to bear to the particular circumstances of the person with disability. And so there's a whole range of ways in which we are working to improve the experience of uh, participants as they engage with the NDIS. Of course, they have the option of seeking an internal review of their plan should they not be happy with it. And they also have the option of a formal appeal to the Australian Administrative Tribunal. But uh, there has to be a point at which the plan 
is finalised, when the participant knows with certainty that that funding is available, and of course, uh, what can then happen is if they have concerns about the elements of the plan, there are options to seek a review or to seek an appeal. 250,000 Australians now being supported under the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, and we're continuing to expand that number. The member for La Trobe. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Special Minister of State. Will the Minister update the House how the government is protecting Australians against foreign actors influencing our democracy? What action is the government taking to ensure Australian elections and our democracy is free from foreign influences, interference? Are there any threats to these achievements? The Special Minister of State has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member La Trobe for his question and his service uh, not just to this House but as a police officer prior to coming to Parliament. No one could ever question the loyalty or the integrity of the member for La Trobe, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Morrison government will always work to strengthen our democracy and the integrity of our democratic system. As members know in this House worldwide today, there are increasing threats to democratic systems. We've seen in recent years the terrible toll wrecked on democracies where foreign influence has penetrated even sophisticated democracies, Mr Speaker. And that's why the Morrison government has legislated to make sure that the integrity of Australia's electoral system is safe. We've banned foreign interference in Australian elections, Mr Speaker. And the Morrison government believes that foreign governments, foreign billionaires and foreign companies have no legitimate role in funding any activities that influence Australian politics or Australian elections. From 1 January this year, Mr Speaker, foreign donations have been banned by the Morrison government. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's the view of this government that it is only Australians who should determine who forms government in Australia. Foreign source funds threaten this principle and they threaten our democratic process. The new legislation restricts political parties, candidates, political campaigners from receiving foreign donations of $1,000 or more, regardless of the purpose. But importantly, third parties are allowed to receive foreign gifts still unless they are for the express purpose of influencing Australian elections. Mr. Speaker. We've put in place severe penalties for breaching the Act, a $42,000 fine or three times the amount of the original gift in case of a breach. And I want to place on record that this government has put strong anti-avoidance measures into this bill, which is important, Mr. Speaker, because who could possibly oppose for, uh, stopping foreign influence in Australian elections, Mr. Speaker? Who could possibly think that there would be a problem with doing that? Well, in reading the Daily Telegraph the other week, Mr. Speaker, the front page of the paper, I read an article entitled "Dastiari's Untold Story." Mr. Speaker, I think this might be Volume 12 of the Untold Story, Mr. Speaker. The untold story that never gets told. But in the untold story, Mr. Speaker, former Labor luminary and Senator Dastiari says, and I'll quote him, that the ban on foreign donations did not solve the problem because there are loopholes you could drive a truck through, Mr. Speaker. So what are we supposed to believe former Labor Senator Dastiari has been doing with his time since leaving Parliament? Is he reading legislation from the Australian Parliament and identifying loopholes in our foreign donation system? Is he sitting there thinking, how can we avoid this act? Well, it begs a lot of questions, Mr Speaker. Has the Leader of the Opposition rung his mate Sam and asked him, you know, would you get off the front page of the paper telling Australians how to subvert our foreign donation laws, Mr Speaker? Of course we would know the Leader of the Opposition wouldn't do such a thing because he is weak, Mr Speaker. We banned foreign the donations Minister and this weak Leader of the Opposition will not. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. I seek leave to move the following motion. That the House 1 notes that a. Australians with a disability and their loved ones have been crying out for a Royal Commission to inquire into violence, abuse and neglect of people with disability. B. Only a Royal Commission has the powers to compel evidence, conduct public hearings and provide a safe place for witnesses to shed a light on the shameful abuse and neglect being suffered by Australians with a disability. C. Today in the Senate at approximately 12.15 p.m. The government voted against a Royal Commission to inquire into violence, abuse and neglect of people with a disability. And D. The government is right now desperately running down the clock so there is not enough time for the House 
to vote on the Senate's message, and e, the government is doing all it can to avoid a second loss on the floor of Parliament in just one week, and two, therefore calls on this Prime Minister to allow enough time in the House so that the Australian people can know where he and the government stands on this important issue. Is leave granted? Leave's not granted. Oh, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion immediately. That the House one notes that a Australians with a disability and their loved ones have been crying out for a royal commission to inquire into violence, abuse and neglect of people with a disability. And b only a royal commission has the powers to compel evidence, conduct public hearings, provide a safe place for witnesses to shine a light on the shameful abuse and neglect being suffered by Australians with a disability. C. Today in the Senate at approximately 12.15 p.m. the government voted against a royal commission to inquire into violence, abuse and neglect of people with a disability. And D. The government is right now desperately running down the clock so there is not enough time for the House to vote on the Senate's message. And E. The government is doing all it can to avoid a second loss on the floor of parliament in just one week. And two, therefore calls on this Prime Minister to allow enough time in the House so that the Australian people can know where he and his government stands on this important issue. Mr Speaker, Labor has been calling for this Royal Commission since the 26th of, Jan 26th of May 2017. We understand that the government does not know how to handle this issue. But that should not be a reason why we cannot vote on this issue of a royal commission. The Senate did a very important report in examining the abuse and neglect of people with disability. That report recommended unequivocally that there should be a royal commission. Labor has met with carers, with people living with disability, with uh, their advocates, with people with shocking stories to tell. Now I understand that the government says there's no need for. Well, we, as, sort of said that there's no need for a Royal Commission, that there is uh, the NDIS that will fix matters up, or that the Aged Care Royal Commission is a sufficient tool to look after people with disability. There's no doubt that the Aged Care Royal Commission will look at the, uh, how young people living in nursing homes are going, but that is not all people with disability. There is no doubt that the NDIS has uh, some standards and regulation which will cover about 10 per cent of the people within the NDIS scheme. But Labor won't give up on this call for a Royal Commission. We've heard this before. When we called for a Royal Commission into the banks, the government said there was no need. Eighteen months, two years later, the government eventually came to the party. But this Royal Commission into the lives of people with disability and the existence of neglect and abuse is in many ways much more urgent and in some ways even more serious than the Banking Royal Commission. I want to draw the parliament's attention as we need to suspend standing orders to debate whether or not we should have a vote on a, a, the a Royal Commission into Disability. I draw to the attention of the parliament the uh, submission of Disability Clothes Line. It noted the propensity for abuse and neglect of people with disability, that it, living in institutional care is swept under the carpet and not properly investigated. The submission contended that momentum for investigation and inquiry of any allegations of this nature requires the following thresholds to be met. And this is the criteria which normally generates a debate about having an inquiry, that a person with disability is raped or abused or killed, and there is enough evidence to ascertain that this has occurred, that the police or justice system has been unable or unwilling to act for a variety of reasons, that a parent of a child or an adult with a disability managed to garner some public interest usually via a sympathetic journalist after much letter writing and pleading to ministers. Then the relevant minister is forced to respond. A review is announced after some lengthy period of time. A review is conducted and occasionally an institution be, can be closed. But the problem is that often these criteria for momentum never are fulfilled. And in the meantime, people with disability are abused. Now, I understand that in this climate, with this uh, contested parliament at this point in the cycle of the 45th parliament, it might be tempting just to dismiss this debate and say, well, there's another time to do it. But when is the right time to have a royal commission? And if, not, if this is not the right time, when is it? And if we do not do it, who will do it? It is a fact beyond doubt. 
beyond any conjecture or debate that people with disability are more likely to suffer violence than people without a disability. It is a fact beyond doubt that children with a disability are three times as likely to experience bullying as children who do not live with a disability. The accounts of abuse in all its forms are harrowing, and I know every member of the parliament is upset when they read these accounts. The question is, what is the solution to the system? Business as usual or something significant of a sufficiently cathartic and powerful nature that we reconsider the whole way in which we're treating people with disability and the fact that they are subject to violence, abuse and neglect. Too many people who have been victims of violence for too long have had to put up with their calls for help being ignored. This call for a Royal Commission is part of our promise to protect people with a disability from the scourge of violence and bullying, from abuse and marginalisation. When we first called for this Royal Commission two years ago, we had no concept or knowledge of the current numbers in the House of Parliament. For us, this has been an issue that we made a decision to back in two years ago. And we make this decision to support a Royal Commission, not because we believe we would have a majority in the House, but because the idea is the right idea for vulnerable Australians. When we made that announcement, I was uh, accompanied by Senator Carol Brown and the member for Jagger Jagger. We met with people with disability, their parents, carers and the people who love them. All members of the House have met the sort of people that I'm talking about, courageous people who call out abuse. They've shared their experiences with us, their trauma and their pain. But what it is worth members of the House recalling when we suspend standing orders in order to debate the merit of a Royal Commission into the lives of people with disability and violence and extremism, what we want to say very clearly is that this, and what they've said to us, is this Royal Commission is not for them. It's for all the people who are still suffering in silence. No one in this House can guarantee that this abuse will not happen again. No one in this House can guarantee that we have currently in this nation a foolproof system to protect vulnerable people from neglect and abuse. On the very day that we announced this policy, Anne Malia, whose precious son Matthew suffered abuse, made an appeal to Australia. I'd like her words to be heard in this House now, even if it's in the context of this motion to suspend standing orders. She said, we need to protect not only the people who've stepped forward and have voiced what's happened to them, but thousands of people and children, adults, adults and children who do not have a voice, who physically do not have a voice. She went on to say this, and whether or not we are successful today or on another occasion, her words ring true. She said, we need to be their voices. We need to protect them. Let's do it now today. We gave a promise then and we give a promise now to all of the self-advocates, to the families, to the people who live with a disability, to all the parents who have teenage children who worry about who will keep them safe when they no longer can. I make it clear that whatever happens in Parliament today, Labor is committed to implementing a Royal Commission to protect people living with a disability from abuse. Now, I understand that in the Senate it may be the case that the government who voted against the Royal Commission could receive the rescue party from One Nation to vote against a Royal Commission. I understand that whilst that may be the case, that those One Nation senators, such as they are, are our valuable allies to the government, I'm going to ask the government to reconsider their opposition to a Royal Commission into disability. And even if people say you don't need to have a Royal Commission, I'll take that interjection from the current leader of government business. A Royal Commission can exercise coercive powers to compel the production of documents. It can compel answers to appear and to, to answer questions. It can conduct its hearings in public. It can accord witnesses predictions that may not otherwise be available in court proceedings. It is fiercely independent. I know there have been many inquiries into this issue of protecting vulnerable people, but all of these inquiries don't seem to stop the problem. They don't seem to have worked to stop the abuse. We need to have fierce independence in a hearing. We need to have public hearings. We need to have the findings of a Royal Commission, which are taken more seriously than any other 
by governments and by the public. Only a Royal Commission can provide the safe space for people with disabilities. The main recommendation of the 2015 Senate inquiry into violence and abuse and neglect against people with disability was a Royal Commission. I understand that today it may be easy for the government to simply say, not easy, but the government may say that um, gee whiz, disability shouldn't be the subject of partisanship. Now, I agree that it shouldn't be the subject of partisanship, but it should not be to the subject of the tyranny of lowest common denominator. People with disability, as we speak, are subject to abuse and neglect. Now, I don't expect any prime minister or government can guarantee right here and right now the safety of people living with a disability in Australia. But if we can't guarantee the safety and the freedom from abuse and neglect of people with disability, why, on goodness sakes, would we vote against a royal commission to protect Australians living with disability, to protect them from abuse and neglect? This is why standing orders should be suspended. And if we are unsuccessful today, we will not give up until we are successful. Is the motion seconded? The member for Barton. Um, indeed, the mo motion is seconded, Mr. Speaker. In 2019, we don't need to read another story in the media about horrific abuse, and we don't need to wait another minute. What we need is a royal commission. Yeah. Every single member of this House has had in their electorate office parents and people with a disability. You all know exactly what we are talking about. You have all sat with these people and gave them the assurances they need. It should be a point of deep shame for the Conservative government that the parliament is again debating the need for, to, to call a royal commission to inquire into the violence and abuse of people with a disability. We already know that 90 per cent of women with intellectual disability have been sexually assaulted, and for 60, 60 per cent of these women it occurs before they are 18. We all know children with disability are at least three times more likely to experience abuse than any other children. It is time for a royal commission. The facts and the stories are numerous, horrific, and we all know them. For far too long, this Liberal government has heard the calls. The calls of people begging them to take the steps to address the terrible abuse of people with disability, and the Labor government would and, and resolutely done nothing at all. In May 2017, the Leader of the Opposition announced that the Labor government, as he said, would establish such a royal commission into the violence um, and abuse of people with a disability upon, um, upon forming government. But here we are, almost two years later, still trying to convince the Conservatives that the abuse of people with disability is a serious problem and it must be addressed. We all know the power and the importance of a Royal Commission. And this issue, this subject and the prevalence of the abuse deserves nothing less than a Royal Commission. And that is what we are asking for on behalf of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that we all see on a regular basis in our electoral office. A Royal Commission is necessary, as a Leader of the Opposition says, for many reasons, some of them he's outlined. But it also, a Royal Commission will also improve services and supports into the future including fixing some of the problems with the rollout of the NDIS. Labor has carefully considered the recommendations of the Senate Community Affairs Committee inquiry into violence and abuse and neglect against people with a disability. The first recommendation of that report was the recommendation calling on a royal commission into the abuse of people with disability. It is an important statement to have been made. We also say very strongly that Labor believes that people with a disability have the right to be heard, to be believed. We will not allow these sickening crimes to be swept under the carpet while the Conservatives continue to bury your heads in the sand. The Liberals think that the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework will be sufficient. 
No, it won't. A royal commission is required, nothing less. We owe it to the many thousands of people that we talk to constantly. We owe it to the many thousands of people with disability that have experienced abuse and neglect. We owe it to the many thousands of families of, of, of people whose children have a disability that have gone through the horror that the Leader of the Opposition outlined, gone through the horror of knowing that their child was abused, going through the horror and try and put yourself in those people's, those parents, those families' shoes. If you put yourself into their shoes, you will know that there is nothing less required on this issue than a royal commission. We have put it out clearly two years ago that that's what's required. And please, I say to the government, listen, if not to me or the Leader of the Opposition or this side of the House, listen to the people that you have spoken to, the families that you have spoken to in your electoral offices and stay true and strong to the things that you said to those people. You know a royal commission is required, and I ask you to agree to one. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. I call the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the members for their contributions. I note that the motion before the House is in relation to suspension of standing orders. Uh, this matter in terms of the motion that was moved by the Senate will be considered by the House when the Parliament resumes next week. It was my understanding when I came in here today that that is precisely what was going to occur. What I understood today was is that the opposition had cancelled the matter of public importance. And so, Mr Speaker, if they didn't wish to use the time of the matter of public importance, then the government has decided to make that time available for question time. Now, let me very, be very clear about the issue of a Royal Commission into the issue of those with disability services. Mr Speaker, they may, they may wish to listen because I'm going to address the members' points. At no time of Prime Minister have I ever opposed what you are proposing. Members on my left. As Prime Minister, I have not. I have kept an open mind on this question and when this question was put to me and we were considering the issue of a Royal Commission into aged care then that was the priority I established as Prime Minister to move on. But I have not resolved not to do this. I have been considering this matter, Mr Speaker. My priority has been to deal with the Royal Commission into Aged Care, which is now underway. I am yet to see a terms of reference from the opposition, I must say, on this matter. They have had a policy for two years, but yet no terms of reference. I suggest that one should have been produced and I would happily look at one that was produced, Mr Speaker. But my point is very simple. This matter will be considered by the House. The government will consider this in all seriousness, as we should, Mr Speaker. These are serious issues. In the past, the government, in responding to these Senate committees and the numerous other reports, have taken the position that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is a scheme that is still being built. It is not yet built. And to have a Royal Commission into a system that is effectively still being built, one would question the wisdom of that at this time. But that said, that does not in any way, shape or form um, turn away from or fail to acknowledge the very serious issues of abuse that we know occur. So I am asking the opposition to continue to engage. I and my government will continue to engage on this issue. There are many ways that the issues that have been raised about abuse can be addressed, even potentially within the existing Royal Commission that we have established. But I will not let us leave from this place with some suggestion that the government does not take these issues seriously, because what we are, have done in <coughs> government is acted on Royal Commissions. The opposition, Mr Speaker, in the past, when they were in government, did not call a Royal Commission into this issue. They did not call a Royal Commission into the banks. They did not call a Royal Commission into aged care, Mr Speaker. On the latter points, we have done both, and we are acting on both, on all 76 recommendations of the one just concluded, and the Royal Commission to aged care is underway. On this further issue, 
We are open to consider how it can be best progressed, and we have been taking action on these issues specifically through the commission that has been established with the NDIS to have the powers to examine and to provide remedies where these cases come up. But there is another part of the motion that has been put by the Leader of the Opposition. The suggestion, and it, it bells the cat as to the motive of what's behind the Opposition's actions this afternoon. I'm not afraid of losing votes in this House. I lost one on Tuesday. But I tell you who the losers were, the Australian people, Mr Speaker, because the Australian people saw the weakness of a Leader of the Opposition who is more interested in the politics of this Canberra bubble than the border protection of our nation, Mr Speaker. I was prepared to come in here and face down the loss of that vote because I have the courage of my convictions when it comes to border protection, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition cannot hold a candle to my convictions when it comes to protecting the security of this nation, Mr Speaker. So vote against us if you like. Try and turn the tables on border protection if you like. There is no middle ground between the Labor Party and the Liberal and National Parties on border protection. There is a wide and huge chasm. There is no the middle Prime ground Minister between us. His seats. Prime Minister will resume his seats. It being 4.30 pm, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn. And I call the member for Bendigo.